everyone, I'm Kevin, otherwise known as Forum BX257, here to bring you another 1980s and 90s G.I. Joe tour review. And today I'll be taking a look at the Cobra Laser Trooper, the 1990 Laser Viper. Laser Vipers make their first comic book appearance in the old Mova comic run of G.I. Joe in issue number 130, and make their first cartoon appearance in the deep animated television series in the first season episode titled United We Stand although they make more prominent appearances in the following episode titled Revenge of the Pharaohs. Before I get to the action figure, I'd like to point out the packaging, specifically the contents list on the side, where there are some strange errors. First of all, it mentions a laser gun, singular, which isn't true. That sort of suggests that it has a separate handheld laser gun apart from what's listed on the rest of the contents list. Then there's this odd grammar here. I'm pretty sure this should have said two laser gun bases. And then it mentions the helmet with visor, almost as if the visor is some type of separate piece, which of course it isn't. All in all, it seems like the package copy editor was having a really off day. First we'll take a look at the Laser Vipers twin laser backpack mounted system. I'll just actually take it off the figure for a better look. It's really well detailed, and it's not quite as floppy as the 1988 Astro Vipers backpack and laser system. They seem to have improved since then. Here we have a control arm, which is very well detailed, and it's on a tiny little peg here, so this thing can move up and down, but it's also on a hollow slider here, so it can go move back and forth as well. Not really sure why they did that, just being out full like this is the best way for the action figure to grip it, considering the type of articulation that the figure actually has. And on top we have the laser rifle barrels, which can move up and down on these bases, and the bases themselves can turn around. The, um, the movement of the bases themselves are a little bit hindered because of these short one and a half inch standard G.I. Joe hoses. I kind of wish they were a bit longer, not only for rotation, but for something else I will just come to right now. But as you can see, the actual backpack itself it's mounted to is very well detailed. It's very easy to uh, imagine this thing being a huge heat vent. as well as this portion here, which sort of matches up with the detail on the figure, which I'll compare to a bit later. But one th very interesting thing about this whole thing is that you have to put everything together, the base, the barrel, even the uh, control arm. There's a instruction di a diagram on the back of the packaging to tell you how to put all this together. But one thing the packaging does not mention is that you can actually remove the base and the laser even after you've plugged it in because they, it doesn't really permanently snap in there like a lot of these put together backpack systems that the G.I. Joe figures came with it, it's not really a permanent thing but it's meant to be removable and I know that even though it doesn't say so because if you look at the peg that this thing went into you'll notice that it actually has some detail the peg itself is rather large and doesn't need to be that large in order to do what it needs to do. But this thing is more or less like a laser gun grip. So the figure can actually hold on to this thing like an independent laser weapon. Which is I think where the contents list was getting a bit confused. And this is what I'm talking about how it's unfortunate that the hoses are not long enough because it would have been nice if you, this thing was long enough for it to be handheld but still plugged into the backpack. The Laser Viper's only other accessory is his Django Fett looking helmet. One nice thing about the helmet is despite the fact that it's designed to drape down beyond his chin it doesn't hinder the articulation of the head at all. A lot of other 
sort of bubble or very large helmets tend to actually connect to the body. So it's really nice that you actually do get some expression out of this guy, despite the fact that he's wearing such a large helmet. The figure is deceptively playing with this very subdued color scheme, mostly being dark gray, which I'm very surprised that they would put on a laser viper. You would think that they would go for a much brighter, eye-catching neon color scheme, kind of like a 1986 sci-fi, but instead they went with a more cobra-like color scheme with the blue, the dark grays, a little bit of black, and just pops of silver. And the pops of silver actually make a bit of sense here. The head is also very interesting. Again, it's deceptively plain. It's almost like a ninja hood. But on top, you can actually see, well, I'm not actually sure if you can see this, but there's kind of like circuitry wire detail on the top of his head. It's very hard to see. I'm sort of glad that they didn't pick this out with paint though, because then it would look like his brain is some type of cyborg or something. But it's more like something that connects to his helmet to give him uh, some sort of heads up display within the helmet or something, or some type of connectivity with his backpack laser targeting system. And then there's this big laser tag like thing on the front, which I'm pretty sure this is kind of what the sculptors were trying to make a dig at. As I'm pretty sure by 1990, laser tag wasn't a thing anymore. But it uh, actually does have a sort of comparison to what's on the backpack. You also notice that he has this um, silver bunch of pouches. It's unfortunate that they're pouches, but I think one nice thing about this is, even though it's a bit loud considering the rest of his color scheme, when you put his backpack on here, it kind of goes. The silver just sort of wraps around and looks like it's part of the backpack on him. That might not be the intention, but it certainly looks that way. That's pretty cool. One very curious thing about the Laser Viper is his prototype. Now here I have the 1990 catalog, which normally has prototypes in here. But as you can see, they photographed the prototype of the Laser Viper, and he is a lot different from the production version. In here, he has a clear helmet, as well as blue wires to affect the lasers to his backpack. Very much different from the standard black that we usually get. So those probably would have been unique wires to the figure. With the clear helmet and the blue almost electric look to the wires, he would have had a very different look. I have to confess that the Laser Viper is one of those figures where I kind of forgot why I bought him. I know I bought this guy for a reason. He's not really that popular or memorable just on his own just to get him as part of the collection. I actually bought him for a very specific reason. And I, I think that one of the reasons was is that I remember reading his file card and seeing that he was actually a support figure for the Heat Vipers, which are the Cobra Bazooka Men, and the Arrow Vipers, which are pilots for the Condor Bombers. So I thought that that was a very, not only very interesting um, way of connecting the whole Cobra universe together there, but it's actually a very practical use of lasers. He's not just shooting lasers out like something out of Star Wars. He's actually using those lasers to pinpoint targets. So here he is with the 1989 Heat Viper, which I do have him uh, displayed with sometimes. And I have to admit that there are a very strange couple here. The Heat Viper being so bright. And you would think that it would be the other way around, color scheme wise. But no, the, uh, the Heat Viper is out in front shooting things. And this guy is sort of hiding in the corner. Um, laser targeting things for this guy. So I guess it kind of works out. I kind of wonder why it took so long for... Hasbro to actually make a Cobra laser equipped figure, or at least a figure that is the primary weapon is a laser gun. 
considering how, how fantastical of the technology that Cobra is supposed to be using here. But I want to compare them to the 1988 Astro Viper, which I mentioned before, and he, there, there are a lot of parallels here. One thing to keep in mind is that even though this guy is mostly an astronaut, the fact of the matter is, is that he doesn't really have a spaceship to go on to. The only other Cobra spaceship made during the time that he, of his release was the Stellar Stiletto, which was a one-man vehicle which already came with a pilot. There was no room for an extra Astro Viper. So he wound up being the de facto laser viper of his time, because that's exactly what he comes with. It's a combination jetpack and twin laser gun with these little handholds. You also notice that he comes with this long helmet as well. So there, there's a lot of parallels between these two guys. However, I have to say that the, um, the, the laser portion of this guy's backpack is needlessly complicated and a bit, um, a bit floppy, to be perfectly honest. At least he comes with these really long uh, hoses, which, of course, this figure doesn't really need because these lasers don't move. So just who would the opposite number for the 1990 Laser Viper be on the G.I. Joe side? Well, it could only be the 1991 Sci-Fi, better known as Sci-Fi version 2. One very interesting parallel between the two th figures is that they're both very subdued in their color scheme. They're basically wearing uh, gray jumpsuits with pops of color over that, and primarily silver weapons. The Laser Viper and second version of Sci-Fi share one more thing in common. The UK release lagged behind the North American releases by a year, and many 1990 releases in 1991 came with spring-loaded missile launchers in order to keep up with the trend. The Laser Viper second release came with Sci-Fi's launcher and missile. If you're looking for a Laser Viper on the aftermarket, he's actually a fairly common figure to find. He doesn't go for very much, despite the fact that his backpack actually comes in a lot of parts that you have to put together. But once you do, they're actually fairly sturdy, so it's not like he's often found with a part of his stuff missing. To be honest, I'm actually surprised that he isn't as popular as he is, because, like I said, he could be a fairly well-done troop builder with his very Cobra-like colors and the fact that he could be both support and, of course, frontline infantry, depending on how you want to use his lasers. There's only two things that you do have to look out for, and, well, of course, they're the, uh, the hoses are often not really missing, as you can get these separately, but the fact is sometimes they are uh, omitted from certain sellers. And I would actually say that you might want to look out for the pegs on his backpack to see if they aren't broken or not. There should be two pegs for the hoses up here and the one peg for the uh, control arm down here. But these seem to be fairly sturdy. I know a lot of other backpacks like the 1988 Astro Viper, you, they really do, um, they really are fairly fragile. But these ones seem fairly sturdy, and I haven't seen a broken one on the aftermarket. But it's still something that you should really be looking out for anyway. was very subtle. I did remember that the 1989 Heat Viper, bleh. 
who is, again, another figure. Whoops. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.